And now we are ready for our final presentation of the day, advocating for social justice and diverse voices in the virtual world. This is by Joanne Wong and Annie Tamino. Joanne Wong is a general librarian at Queens Public Library in Hunters Point. Prior, she was a librarian at the Chancellor Robert R. Livingston Masonic Librarian. She received her ML MILS at Pratt Institute with a certificate in archives in 2017. Annie Tamino serves as head of special collections and archives at Queens College City University of New York. In the past, she worked as the archivist at SUNY Maritime College and as a project archivist at Columbia University Museum of the City of New York and the Queens Museum. She received her MLIS and archive certificate from Queens College in 2010 and MS in Maritime and Naval Studies from SUNY Maritime in 2020. And you may take it away. Awesome, so hold on just one second as I start sharing my screen. Great, so all good to go. So first, hello everyone. And thank you so much for coming to, to today's session, uh, advocating for social justice and diverse voices in the virtual world. As mentioned, my name is Joanne Wong and I'm a general librarian at the Hunters Point branch. And I'm joined by my colleague, Annie Tamino, who is the head of special collections and archives at Queens College CUNY. So first, uh, before we begin, we do want to give a big shout out to the following individuals listed alphabetically here who have provided significant support and resources to make the following programs a reality. So the names are Norka Blackman Richards, Kristen Hart, Jeremy J. Saru, Natalie Milbrot, Obde Mondesir, and Jeannie Pei. All right, can people hear me? Great. <laughs> so Queen's Memory is, just to give a little background, is a community archiving program administered by Queen's Public Library and Queen's College CUNY. Founded in 2010, Queen's Memory has become an award-winning program that has collected over 600 oral histories and engages with the public through programming, trainings, a podcast, and more. And while the public library really focuses on sort of the neighborhoods throughout the borough of Queens, um, we at the college uh, focus more on the history of the campus and its alumni, students, faculty, and staff. So in the early days of the pandemic, um, back in March of last year, COVID-19 hit the borough of Queens harder than almost anywhere else in the United States. Knowing that it can be difficult to reconstruct experience after the fact, Queens Memory wanted to create a lasting record of how people were living, working, learning, and helping one another uh, during this historic period. So we initiated the COVID-19 project to document people's experiences in real time. In order to advertise the project and solicit submissions from the public, we shared weekly prompts on social media, exploring various aspects of living under lockdown. Um, we also partnered with the Urban Archive, which is a digital history organization, and they really helped create the technical infrastructure that was needed to collect these submissions in a variety of formats, which included photos, videos, written reflections, uh, student work, and oral histories. Um, so pictured here is one of our social media prompts. Uh, this particular topic was our new normal, uh, and the prompt was, uh, what is one way your life will never be the same? And so during this time, we also were doing public programs. So prior to the panels that we'll be talking about today specifically, we have been hosting a mini series of pre-recorded interviews with local businesses, artists, and organizations called What Shapes Our Communities. These interviews consisted of us talking to these community members about themselves, their work, and their organization, and also how they have been adapting to the COVID-19 crisis. In addition, we did a few closed workshops, such as Trivia Night and Memory Kaleidoscope Game Sessions. Now, as our virtual programs continue to grow, our goals started to solidify into the following. Addressing current events as they were happening, reaching the widest possible audience, and creating active discussion. And so that all led to our first event. And so this first event was held on June 17th of 2020 with Queens College on Facebook Live. 
was called Model Minority vs. COVID-19 Education Through Crisis for Asians in America, which was moderated by Frank Wu, the first Asian American to serve as president of Queens College. This event focused on the racial backlash caused by the association of COVID-19 with Asians and this racism's historical context. While organizing this event, it became apparent that COVID-19 did not cause, but amplified existing social inequities and injustices. During our event, the police murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis on May 25th and the subsequent protests against police brutality and racism against the, across the country heavily influenced the discussion among the speakers and our audience members. Many of the comments and questions were about how to be better allies in the movement for racial justice and how to eliminate anti-Blackness in communities. This inspired us to expand the series as well as to specifically work on an event that would speak to the Black Lives Matter movement. So building on the model minority event uh, for the fall 2020 semester, we created a three part series of programs on civic issues and social justice as they relate to our past and present. In creating this series, we wanted to replicate the ingredients that made the June program so successful. This included the tech, the use of social media, a dynamic mix of speakers and roundtable format. And Joanne's gonna kind of discuss each of those components in more detail later. So in selecting speakers and topics, our goal was to empower diverse and multi-generational voices and to support leaders on the Queens College campus who are really already at the forefront of ongoing diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And specifically, we worked with the SEEK program, which is an opportunity program for low-income students in the CUNY system, the Black Latinx Faculty Staff Association, or BLFSA, which recently had issued a call um, for anti-racist changes um, on campus, a specific kind of slate of demands. And also CERU, which is the Center for Ethnic, Religious and Racial Understanding, uh, which facilitates cross-cultural engagement to advance understanding. Um, so I'm sure each kind of campus probably has its own kind of version of these kinds of organizations and entities. Um, so we invited representatives of these entities to really um, help shape the topics and themes of the programs, to suggest speakers, and to connect us with student activists um, so that they were active partners in, in shaping the programming. Now, as community archivists, we also really saw um, these programs as methods of documentation, as well as forms of engagement. Um, so these were really set against the backdrop of the pandemic, the movement for black lives and the two 2020 election. So we were transparent art for our desire that these would be contributed to the archives um, after you know, the events were done for long-term preservation and all speakers signed consent forms to this effect and were given plenty of time to ask questions before signing. So we developed, uh, sorry, we designed the three part series so that the topics and themes would build on one another, although it was optional whether audience members um, would participate, or, sorry, to uh, view one um, of the events or, or all of them or whatever they wanted. So um, the programs took place about a month apart, starting with the Black Lives Matter movement and anti-racism in public higher education on September 22nd. And speakers for this program included Enoch Jemmett, a student activist, uh, Allison Regis, who was a counselor in the SEEK program, Sorabel Hanau, who is a faculty member active in the BLFSA I mentioned earlier, and also William Sales, who was a former director of SEEK, but is also a Malcolm X scholar, activist um, since the 1960s in civil rights and black liberation. So together, uh, these speakers provided critical perspectives on historical and current fights against racism um, in higher education specifically and society at large. Next up on October 6th was the program Fighting for the Future, Political Engagement and Student Leadership, which we hope would inspire participation in what was then the upcoming November 3rd election. So this event featured Asia Gray of Saru two student activists, as well as a recent alumni who now works in politics at the state level. And uh, it was moderated by the head of the SEEK program, Norca Blackman Richards. So this program was especially inspiring, I thought, uh, because it had demonstrated the myriad ways that students are making a political and social difference um, during and after their QC careers. And also sort of engendered a discussion about how people can get involved in the process of making social change. So we finished the series in November with Power and Depression in the Archives, 
which discuss the role and responsibilities of archivists in building a more diverse historical record. And for our speakers, we had Ubdin Mandesir from uh, QC and Cynthia Tobar from the Bronx Community College, who are each working on um, oral history pro projects as sort of a method for creating that diversity in the archives. And so as you notice with a lot of our events, there's multiple speakers. So the main question is why are we using a round table discussion format? So specifically when I mean, when I'm saying that, what I mean is that we're having one moderator, several speakers, and the moderator is asking and passing questions to the speakers throughout the event. Q&A always happens at the end of the event and each event ended up totaling to about 90 minutes each. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the roundtable discussion style was very ideal for these types of sessions as one of our goals was to inspire conversation. Due to the format of this type of program of one moderator and several speakers, we we're able to get these important conversations started in the event itself amongst our moderators and several speakers. With no need for slideshow presentations, the new insights and perspectives that came out of these conversations between academics and their students was powerful and not static at all. In addition, this made our audience Q&A interactive as multiple perspectives to the same question were able to be relayed. Overall, this format was more enjoyable for both our speakers, as you can see, everyone is smiling in this picture, and for our audience. And we were able to hold the attention of everyone for 90 minutes at a time, which in virtual world, as we all know, that is a very long span of time. So how to set up a roundtable discussion. So I put a template into the slides and I will share them also in the chat as well in a little bit. But a few pointers I would like to give is that active preparation and planning are key to making a successful roundtable event. First, you should always have a pre-meeting with your moderator. Offer to create the set of questions that you would uh, that would be used for the events as well. A lot of moderators really appreciate this. Only one moderator out of the four events we listed, only one declined this offer. So always make the offer um, because it, it just makes the process a lot more easy for our moderators and our speakers. Uh, and so next after, once you have a set of questions, make sure you review them with your moderator, especially if they had taken up your offer to, for you to make them and that you have their approval. Indicate that this is a working document and that they are able to edit anything that they see. Once your moderator has approved this, then send the questions to your panelists. Once again, indicate that this is a working document and your panelists can add or edit any questions as they see fit as well. Finally, have your panelists initial which questions they feel strongly about um, and are interested in answering that question first. The reason why we do this is that people are always allowed to comment and they're always allowed to jump in after a panelist has answered initially, but having an idea of who wants to answer the question first is always useful for a moderator as it allows for seamless transitions between question and answer and no awkward pauses and silences as people try to figure out who's going to be the first one to answer. This should all be discussed during a pre-meeting before our panel. Always have the pre-meeting with everyone, moderators, speakers, hosts, at least seven days before your actual program, as this is to ensure tech is working and that everyone is comfortable with the final set of questions that we will be using. In addition, have opening scripts ready and prepped, as well as bios to make proper introductions for both your moderators and your speakers. Lastly, for any type of program, but especially these, transparency is key. As Annie mentioned, there are consent forms that we do have our speakers sign. But for me, um, especially, I constantly re reiterate it to the moderators and speakers, um, even after all consent forms have been signed, where the program would be available during the event, in this case it was Facebook Live, and where it will be available after for the public. In doing so, you can ensure them that they know where their image, opinions, and conversations will be publicly available um, during this time. So bringing online. So in order to do this, um, one of the ways that we did it was using a platform called StreamYard. Now StreamYard, this is a screenshot of what StreamYard looks like from the backend perspective. StreamYard is a third party platform that you can use to stream to various social medias, specifically Facebook Live and YouTube Live. As a disclaimer, there is both a paid and a free version of this program. The free program has many of the following capabilities that I will be listing unless otherwise noted. So we like this program because it allowed us to have multiple speakers on the screen at the same time in an easy format, and you had better control over the screen layout of what was being streamed to our audience, i.e. who is being highlighted, is everyone being shown versus active speaker, etc. 
In addition, the platform ensured quality streaming allowed for audience interaction via chat to occur in the platform itself. So I did not need to have a separate device open to check to read comments. Also, the platform did not require speakers to have a Facebook account, allowing us a wider reach of possible speakers. And it was also browser-based, which meant no need for downloading any apps or software. For us ourselves, we did have the paid version. So we were able to personalize our screens with, with specific logos and also to obtain quality recordings of both video and audio files of the event. Now, as I mentioned, we used Facebook Live. So why did we choose this? Once again, going back to our goals, we wanted to bring this information to the widest demographic of our communities, but also make it easy and accessible for them to virtually attend. So to reach the greatest number of community attendees and to not restrict access and outreach to only academia, we found that Facebook Live was a really great way to do so. By streaming on Facebook Live via the Queen's Memory Facebook page, the content was easy to view, share, and rewatch. In addition, attendees did not need an account or to register in order to watch. We will note that there was an assumption for many that you did need an account in order to watch, so our outreach did involve letting community members know that this was not needed. In addition, Facebook events was helpful in spreading the word since the platform allows attendees to invite others. Overall, this allowed us to inform a larger demographic than a closed platform, unlike many traditional virtual academic programming would. Okay, so in terms of getting turnout to these events, um, we really utilize many channels um, with uh, our two organizations, um, postings on websites and social media through the Queen's Memory Program, as well as Queen's Public Library and Queen's College. And then these listings and events were shared by, you know, individual speakers and co-sponsors of the programs, and they were really able to reach um, audiences and populations that we probably wouldn't have been able to reach on our own. Um, and then for the third event, which was on power and oppression in the archives, um, it was especially su uh, successful to do outreach to graduate schools of library and information science and to utilize um, archive and library listservs. And I think there was um, a lot of sign up for that because it's a topic people are really eager to learn about right now. So as far as outcomes from this initiative, um, one of the most positive outcomes is that it really strengthened so many relationships. Um, first between the Queens Public Library and Queens College Library, um, and also between our libraries and the organizations that co-sponsored the events. Um, in addition to, you know, Joanne and myself, um, there was, you know, a kind of a group of librarians um, from Queens College Library that were all involved and kind of worked on it together. And that sort of brought us together, so kind of cross unit pollination. And we were especially grateful for the support of our chief librarian, Kristen Hart, um, who really kind of provide, not only got involved in a very hands-on way, but really kind of brought this to the attention of the administration. And I think it was, um, it would have been hard to pull this off without kind of administrative support from above. And so after the program, oh, I'm just making sure. Annie, did you? Oh, wait, I think oh. I missed a slide, didn't I? Oh yes, fostering, um, do we have fostering timely and needed discussions? Yeah, okay, sorry, mm -hmm. I lost my place there. Um, so another goal of doing this was that, you know, the Queens College Library, Library wanted to actively support the Black Latinx Faculty Association's demands um, to make Queens College a more supportive and affirming environment for Black and Latinx uh, faculty, staff, and students. And we hoped that the roundtables would be a, a contribution to that effort. So we were gratified when the director of the SEEK program, uh, who facilitated the October event, uh, reported that, quote, the positive reviews and feedback coming my way have not ceased. Um, each one of them is confirmation that this conversation was timely and needed. Um, so while these campus issues were a big part of our kind of um, strategy for why we wanted to work on this, um, we also um, made sure that the discussions were sort of broad enough and not too campus specific so that they would really be of interest to the whole community. Um, because this topic of how to create a more just and inclusive future is, you know, really one that applies to all of us in our various contexts. So I would say that um, I think that generally this kind of, um, uh, I guess, way of having a, a partnership between the public library and the academic library has been really successful and, you know, I think is fairly rare or unusual. Um, so um, I think it's something that's been really effective for us and something that maybe more academic libraries would want to consider partnering with public libraries.
And so after the program, you know, when we do these events, they don't just disappear. Um, so for many of us, informing and educating is a big key part of our core library values. And so this should also extend after the event itself is over. So the big question is what happens, um, especially for these roundtable discussions. So first, Facebook does automatically archive these events, allowing people to rewatch and share, ensuring longevity and growth of viewers on this platform. We also do keep an archive version available on our aviary portal, which is our digital portal for archival AV material for Queen's memory. And so what do the numbers mean and what, what does success mean in general? So for Facebook data, there are several metrics that I have to first define. Um, I typically determine end of stream views as the final view count immediately after an event is over. The number is not static. The minute an event ends, you have to look at it. Otherwise, it will keep changing. Um, and so this includes anyone who might have popped by at any moment for any length of time during the event itself. Peak live concurrent views is the highest number of viewers at any given point during the event. And both of these statistics are valuable. As you can see that information, you can use that information to then reflect on what kept your audience's interest, engagement, et cetera. In addition, you can return to the video to check and see how views are doing on the video at a later date, adding on to that end of stream view count. Especially in this virtual world, replays are extremely valuable and continue that mission to inform and educate our communities. For instance, as you can see from our numbers over here, while our second event technically had the lowest live attendance, it has grown tremendously through replay values due to people sharing the video after the event and circulating it on their own social media channels. And so as you can see, um, for many events, um, we were very successful. You know, the, um, our Black Lives Matter movement panel had 71 uh, peak live concurrent views. Um, and then, but the total was 401, power and oppression was 96 was the peak, 278 was the um, total. And then for fighting for the future, the peak was 27 and the end of stream was 253. But as you can see, it has grown tremendously to 945. And that is as of November 30th, 2020. So those numbers are actually higher, uh, the last number is higher uh, as of right now. So um, as we're nearing the end of our presentation, you can find us at these following links. Um, we'll include all these links into the chat box in a minute. And also feel free to email either of us um, at our email addresses as we'll be happy to answer any additional questions. And we'll also put them in the chat too. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing. So if anyone has any questions, concerns, um, please feel free to write them in the chat or the Q&A and we can answer them. Alrighty. All right, thank you so much to both of you. That was fantastic. It was a great presentation and um, I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A at this moment, but we're gonna give people a chance to uh, throw their thoughts in there. So let me see, I'm going to... You're gonna throw in a, our link into the chat, Joran? Gonna throw a oh, lot great. of links into that, you know, especially as we're talking about virtual world. <laughs> um, we're gonna, I'm gonna throw a couple of them in there. Um, yeah, uh, so how has participation been with submitting oral histories, etc.? Um, Annie, do you want to take that one? Sorry. Oh, okay, seeing that in the chat. Um, so submitting oral histories, so it's kind of interesting because, um, at the college, um, a lot of the oral histories that we've done have been more by the staff. So um, I think that's a difference between the public library model and the uh, college um, model is that a lot of the stuff that kind of happens through the Queens Public Library part of Queens Memory is volunteers working with the project um, or just community members, maybe interviewing um, people in their neighborhoods, people in their homes, and then submitting that. So it's almost a little bit more like StoryCorps or something like that. Uh, but they do have a lot of trainings on a lot of volunteers. On the college side of it, which is what I'm more experienced in, we do have um, uh, one staff member who's focused on oral history and another who helps coordinate when there's requests for oral history. So we did kind of targeted outreach to document different people's experiences with um, 
transitioning to this um, online world on campus. Um, and we tried to make sure those were diverse perspectives. Um, for example, we interviewed um, the head of facilities who had to deal with, you know, all these kind of new cleaning protocols and buildings and grounds protocols and how to get onto campus. Um, we targeted different faculty. Um, and, you know, one thing that's a little bit absent is the student perspective. We haven't really done oral histories with students, it's kind of harder to make those connections for us. Um, but actually, that's been a little bit more successful in terms of getting them to submit like essays that they've written through classes, or just their own photos or kind of um, things like that. And to add on to that, um, so first I threw all the links there, including the template for creating a roundtable discussion, um, but to coming at it from the public librarian side, um, what, what we've been kind of doing has been like, as Annie was saying, a lot of volunteers, Quiz Memory has actually lost, launched an ambassadors program where several branches were chosen to create um, with, with the assistance of library staff and volunteers to create oral history projects of the neighborhood. So for me, um, I'm Hunter's Point. So I've been doing a lot of the Hunter's Point uh, interviews in that neighborhood. So it's, it's, it's been interesting to, at least for my particular ambassadors project has been more, has been very um, business industry based just because industry has been a big factor of the Hunter's Point area. So that's just coming from that specific perspective. Um, another question um, was, were you able to contact important past leaders and others from the community who moved away from the area? Um, I do want to add one quick thing is that because this was a virtual event, what was really helpful about this is that, you know, we didn't require people driving to Queens College or Queens Public Library to, to, to participate in this event. People were coming from, people who were attending from all over the place, all over the country. Um, and even Frank Wu, who moderated the first event with, um, uh, with uh, Model Minority, and he also moderated the Black Lives Matter uh, pa panel. Um, he was, and Annie, correct me if I'm wrong, he was, he was uh, streaming from the West Coast, mm -hmm. streaming from, from the West Coast. So, you know, these are, you know, virtual, does allow for that location um, aspect to kind of not be as um, people are requiring travel. I guess is the best way to. And then from the college side, as far as like the oral histories part of it goes, you know, I did get questions from like we had adjuncts, uh, faculty, for example, who contacted me and said, "I'm since the pandemic, I've been in Florida. I'm teaching from here, but I want to. Can I still contribute? What it's like to be teaching remotely in this climate?" And I said, "Yes, of course. We, anyone that kind of has a connection to this community." And then we also did a. Um, kind of like a little event to advertise the project uh, with two alumni specifically. And we developed, you know, we saw, we saw those prompt cards. We actually developed a couple prompts, not just for them, but just in general for kind of like maybe people who have moved away who are thinking about their relatives or friends or memories of Queens and kind of how that was impacting them, especially just kind of going back to what it was like in March and April when we kind of really were at the epicenter and it was kind of before it had gotten so widespread. Um, you know, I think there was a lot of people who had family in Queens still who may not be there um, and wanted to be able to reflect on that. And so another question I see is, so thank you Fatuma for attending th these panels. Um, I, uh, thank you for attending those events um, that we held. Um, I do see another question. This is, uh, thank you so much for all the work that went into this project and the continued dedication to varied voices. How has digital storage worked? Is that an ongoing conversation on sustainability for this project? So Annie, I, I feel like you would be the better. Yeah, so one on of the things that we're kind of lucky about is that when we started the Queen's Memory Project, um, we, you know, we had to develop a memorandum of agreement. So there is kind of a legal memorandum of agreement of who does what, uh, which is really important. So for example, right now, um, the Queen's College Library uh, hosts the website, for example, the Queen's, uh, Queen's Memory website, but the Queen's Public Library agreed to do all of the digital preservation. So it's in the MOU that they're the ones responsible for long-term digital preservation of these digital assets. Um, and they also have a full-time metadata um, digital archives manager who kind of executes the, those digital preservation strategies um, in conjunction with the IT program. But I do know it was kind of a concern that was raised that before the pandemic hit, all of the oral histories were done uh, audio only, there was no video at all. And so now that we have these, you know, once we started doing um, during the pandemic, doing kind of things like Zoom recordings, which are much bigger files, um, I think it, it's 
there's not been any pushback per se yet, but it was kind of like, this is probably gonna come. Like, <laughs> I guess the director of Queen's Memory has been saying for a while, you know, video is on the way, it can't be ignored. <laughs> and this is kind of making that happen. So we'll have to see how that um, kind of unfolds. And then, but just one last thing I wanna say is, um, Annie, you had mentioned before about getting the student perspective. Um, I think that these panel series were really great because okay. uh, as you might've noticed, um, besides the last one, there were students on, on all of the events, that, whether it was the first one or the first two in the series itself. Um, there were so many, there were a lot of students that we wanted to engage with and have them have their voices on. And it was great to see kind of, uh, the intergenerational conversations that were happening. And I think, um, and Annie, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of those students were also interested in Queen's memory after being a part of the events as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good point. All right, it looks like we're at time. Thanks again to both of you. This was you. really, really great. Um, I, I personally learned a lot. Um, and uh, that is actually the end of this year's conference. Um, I would like to give one last shout out to our conference team who uh, all put a lot of hard work into this. Uh, it's something I, I think we're all really uh, committed to putting on this conference every year. This is our seventh one. And uh, I think we're all passionate about it. And I know uh, my colleagues on the committee have worked really hard. So thanks again to Jennifer DeVito from Stony Brook University, Bill Jones, SUNY Geneseo, Carrie Martin, SUNY Purchase, Jessica McGivney, SUNY Farmingdale, and Jen Parker, SUNY Cortland. Another big, big thank you to all of our presenters. I think everyone just did a, a fantastic job. This has been quite a year. And um, uh, just as, as the, the point of this conference is to just uh, see how everyone made lemonade out of lemons. Uh, it feels weird talking about silver linings when you're talking about a pandemic because you don't want any of this happening. But uh, library folk are really resourceful and uh, I'm, I'm continually impressed with uh, how everyone has adapted. Um, with that being said, thanks again to everyone who joined us today. If you enjoyed today, consider submitting a proposal to and or attending our annual SUNY Law Conference, which is usually in person, but this year it's virtual. It will be hosted by SUNY Delhi. It's going to be on June 16th through the 18th. So save that date. And uh, once again, thanks for attending. There, there will be recordings going out to uh, everyone who has registered. So uh, with the email that you registered there, you'll get an email with a link to the recordings once they're up and uh, the presentations. And I'm sure all of our presenters would be more than happy to uh, you know, field questions after this. And um, we'll also be seeking feedback via a survey. So let us know what you think, any ideas for next year's conference. We're always looking to learn and grow. And uh, we hope to see you in February, 2022. And uh, thanks again.